Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Releasing My Pain presentation, Jesus explains that once the facade is released, pain is easy to identify and experience, and he outlines the methods to release pain and gives general notes and guidelines for the release of pain through an emotional experience with God's help. Recorded on the 25th of May 2016 in Nusaville, Queensland, Australia. All right, welcome this morning. This morning we'll be discussing this uh, subject of releasing my pain. Now, many of you are going to want to skip everything we talked about yesterday and just try to get to this, what we talk about today. And uh, honestly, you can't do that. You're not going to be able to do that. And, and in fact, attempting to do it is really counterproductive to your progress. So a lot of the material that we're now going to present to you, like yesterday's material and today's material, really doesn't apply to most of you yet. I'm sort of giving you a, a lead-in of where you've got to go. And later this afternoon, when I give you some group feedback, we'll be talking about how to measure where you are in the stream of things here. And it is, it's quite simple to, to measure where you are based on as long as you're self-reflective emotionally. It's quite simple to measure where you are in the stream of things and what, what, you, where, what stage you're up to, if you like. But, but we thought we needed to discuss this releasing my pain with you so that you understood the process when you get to that process, that you actually understand the process a bit more and that you understand sort of the underlying goals and, and also um, understand some basic principles about how God is helping you already. And that's one of the things I'd like to also discuss with you in, in this section is how God helps you go through every part of the process. And um, God is always presenting with you or to you the very next thing you need to address or deal with. And your humility is the thing that allows him to work with in terms of identifying those particular things. And we'll talk more about that. But let's uh, get started on releasing my pain. Let's cover first, though, what I already have done by this stage. <laughs> in other words, by this stage, you need to have already done quite a number of things before you can actually really connect to and release your pain freely. And uh, obviously, if you think about what we've presented over the last you know, three and a half days already, then you'll see that what you already would need to have done is understood your, how, you pay, how your pain was developed. You need to have understood how your facade is developed. You need to, and this is a real key point, you need to have accepted your facade. So that's an emotional process of accepting your facade. So that would need to have, ha have happened. You would also, um, before you can release your pain, you find you're going to have to, in, in, as a part of the process, also you're going to have to have probably felt this, the global feeling of terror, and released quite a lot of that terror so that you can get down below. So, so we need to have uh, emotionally processed global terror and remember we're using that term loosely it's not it's not the world's terrors your own terror that pervades everything that you do obviously also remember the reason for the facade was two twofold wasn't it it was one to to avoid this terror this terror of emotion and so forth. And, and the second 
reason for the facade was de to desensitize yourself to emotion, to pain, in particular pain. So you would have to have ha have to have sensitized yourself. In other words, become more sensitive. Uh, <laughs> to emotion. All right. Does that make sense? Now, in amongst that process, you would also have probably, and and I would say not probably, but prob but it's more like. You, it's necessary to develop the quality of faith. So you would have you would have, have developed faith, developed faith, developed faith. And here we're talking about faith in God, faith in God's goodness, faith in God's laws and so forth. You would have had to have developed enough faith to even do these things because to do those things is quite challenging. So you would have to have had enough faith developed to even go ahead and do that. So, so this talk really assumes that those things are done or primarily done, you know, mostly done. And the reality is that unless those things are primarily done, you're going to struggle with the release of pain. And in fact, the only pain you'll be able to release is where there is very little fear associated with that particular pain and where um, it, you don't have to go through your global terror to get to the pain and where you haven't had to develop very much faith in order to get to the point of feeling that pain. And that is the only type of pain you will have released at that point. Does that make sense? But you will have also released at that point, the pain, you would start to feel the pain of your facade. In other words, you would, you would be starting to feel like that, that your facade itself is painful. And remember, in the deconstruction of the facade process, you do go through quite a lot of emotions feeling about your facade. And, and it changes from feeling good to feeling quite bad whenever you've engaged your facade. And in fact, what happens is you instantly feel some pangs of conscience every time you engage your facade. And you also instantly feel some pain about the negative consequences every time you've engaged your facade. So you, so you start recognising that your facade is the generator of your sin. So your facade is the primary generator of your sin, without, without a doubt. And... and you know, the facade is desperate to get comfort and satisfaction through a lot of very unloving behaviours called your addictions. But it's also whenever those addictions are met, it's desperate to get anger, you know, to be angry and rageful in, in an effort to control its environment back into satisfying addiction. Right. So, so by this stage, by the time you're getting to releasing your pain, you'll find that you have very little anger. Does that make sense? Because you've already had to deconstruct all of that in the deconstruction of your facade process. And, and your anger is because you're, you still want your addictions met and by the time you get to releasing your pain and desiring the release of your pain, you no longer still want your addictions met. In fact, you find your addictions quite sleazy and uncomfortable. And, and as a result of that, you have a feeling that you, you know, every time you engage one of them, like indiscriminately, you, you automatically feel that bad about the fact you've done that. Does that make sense? Because you're now much more sensitive to that. Ben, would you like to ask? Is that point where you feel your facade feels bad when you're in. Is that the actual point of ex accepting it? Um, no, um, it's usually in between the point of accepting it and deconstructing it. When, when you start going through the process of deconstructing it, part of the motivation for deconstruction is that you do feel 
that it's actually not helping you anymore. You know, at the moment, for the majority of you, you still believe that your facade is the best you. Still believe that your facade is the way, the best way for you to interact with the world. You still believe that your facade is the best way to get what you want from the world. And and once you've given all that up, you feel quite um, uncomfortable with your facade, but you haven't yet deconstructed it. There's a motivation to deconstruct it. You, you, if you like a aspiration, and there's an aspiration inside of you to deconstruct it, but but you've not yet truly deconstructed it because you had to go through processes, emotional processes, to deconstruct your facade. But uh, at least you're aware of it and you want to deconstruct it and it doesn't feel good having it. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's quite an uncomfortable place and most people, that's why most people when they hit that place, you know, want to run away. But that's still just the start. Like, well, there's still a lot of work before you actually accept all that and... Yeah, well, uh, I suppose the best way to put it is this, Ben. Uh, with any uh, with any growth, so let's say this is a time frame of growth, it's very, very hard, isn't it, to pinpoint when you've actually made a change at, at some point or in that thing. It's th The only way you really can see when you made a change is when you get up here and you look back on that. Do you see what I'm saying? So for many of you you'll go through that process where you'll make these transitions and then after you've made them and a few months after you look back and you think, oh, I think I've made that transition now, you know, because I'm not getting angry much anymore. I'm accepting my facade. I'm not going off the, you know, off the deep end every time that somebody points something out that's unloving inside of me. And I want to know the truth now. I can feel I want to know it. I feel I'm trying to live it. I, every, time I feel, every time I engage my facade, I notice myself doing it now. So I've now got some awareness. And, and getting to that point, sometimes it's a slow process getting to that point. You go beyond that point, and then you look back and then you realise you're at that point sort of thing. So it's, it's, very, it's hard to say, you know, this is in the progress, this is the point where you made the transition. Usually you'll get further than that and then you'll look back and then you'll go, oh, I think I've made this transition. Does okay. that make sense? It does, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk later on this afternoon in our group feedback about how to determine where you're at in terms of what needs to be done yet. And it, your feelings inside of yourself determine where you're at. They do. And that's why it's very, very important to know what you're feeling, because otherwise you won't be able to measure where you are. Yep. Is there any other questions, Dave? Yeah. I'm nowhere near accepting my facade. Yep. But on some things, I'm I'm feeling uncomfortable when I've engaged them or even the thought of them. Yep. Is that because, like, I don't like like the after effects, like a hangover, or am I a little bit sensitive into some things? Yeah. What happens is that we have a growing awareness, Dave, in some issues. You know, the usually the easier issues. And, um, and so we have a growing awareness in those particular areas. So that'll be the first ones you become sensitive to. And then slowly as things go on, yeah, and you become more aware, more open uh, and more humble, then new things, you become more sensitive, new things. And eventually you see the whole picture. And in fact, I feel um, the time you really see the, your entire picture of your facade is almost just before you become at one with God. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you sort of realise, wow, I did that back then and that back then and that back then and that back then. But, but by this stage, uh, it's usually after you've deconstructed it that, that you really start to see how everything was playing out. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so as you're going through it, it's a bit like, I love, I love a statement in one of the R.J. Lee's books, I think it's the, well, it's actually made all the way through the three books, where he says, while you're in the birth, birthing process, you don't really know what's going on and everything's hard to assimilate. But afterwards, you've got time to think about it and, and feel about it, and then you can look back and then you can see what happened. And that's often what's the case when it comes to all this processing with the soul. You, it's not like, it's not like, uh, uh, it's only somebody who has already been through it all generally who can tell you where you're at. Because you, at the time, don't really know where you're at until you get to the next point and you look back and you go, oh, that's where I was at. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Diana, just straight behind. Yeah, is it like as um, going through this process to reach 
this bit where I'm nowhere near. Yeah. Um, is that like also a gradual process of letting go of control? Of course. Oh, that's good. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Very relieved <laughs> to hear that. Well, I don't know whether you oh, are, okay. actually. No, I'm terrified <laughs> of it. You have a lot of control. I yeah. do. I do. I'm yeah. terrified of letting go of control. Yeah. But I've got some, like, an excitement with anticipation. Yeah. At what it might feel like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful yeah. place because uh, you also don't have to – you know at the moment how many of you fret over decisions and – you know, you you know, you, you you don't know what the right decision is, and you tr you really just a lot of times throwing up a coin and going heads or tails when it comes to a decision, aren't you? And that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore, and it, and it's really wonderful because you you know exactly what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, what you're going to do, the timing you're going to do it, everything, and uh, and decisions are so much more easily undertaken, and and done without. Uh, like things that you more normally would threat, fret about for months and months uh, um, are decided in moments, you know, and so things become much more rapid in your life. Things that things change becomes much more rapid, and and also, uh, and I'm talking about positive change becomes much more rapid in your life, and you notice it happening around you, and and, and the more it happens, the more excited you get, <laughs> naturally. So. Yeah. Anyway, let's proceed, shall we? Because we need to discuss what releasing the pain is all about. So, we, we, but we understand this is what we've already done. We, so, so if we haven't already done that, then basically releasing our so releasing our pain is going to be quite difficult to to embrace. And the only pain we're going to get to release is the bits where we don't have the global terror blocking, and we've got a little bit of faith about dealing with that particular thing, and we've accepted some that pain from our childhood or whatever. And usually it's the very obvious things that we've processed by this stage, but not much, not much else. And then we have to go through this process, and now it's got to the point now with things that we were clueless about before we're now aware of. And this is before we release our pain, our facade, Remember, is the thing suppressing our awareness of all of what's under? So our facade, once we've deconstructed it, which we went through yesterday, and we discussed the global emotions and the individual emotions needed, um, once we've deconstructed our facade, you can see that everything that's underneath will naturally start to come up. Makes sense, doesn't it? While the facade's there, remember its point is to desensitise yourself, its point is to control this global feeling of terror, and while it's there, it's suppressing everything. And it, getting access to any of that pain is really hard in that place. You know, it's like you, you'd be driven nuts trying to analyse the whole thing, right? And most of you have been driven nuts by it, right? So, so you know that that doesn't work very well. And, and, and of course... It's not the way God designed the soul to operate anyway. To, to use your intellect uh, greatly is not a major thing that God's designed. He, he wants you to learn how to use the intelligence of the soul. And the soul has a mind, I suppose you could call it, but, but the soul's mind is basically its emotional feelings. Not, not a, and they generate thoughts. It's not the other way around. Yeah. Okay, so we've already done these things. Okay. Assuming we have, what do we do now? <laughs> Someone said party. <laughs> that was you, Nina, was it? <laughs> Go out and sin some more. <laughs> In a celebration. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so besides the party that you have, um, what we want to do is look at what happens after that. Right? Now, this is where I'd like to talk to you about something that is really important for you to understand, and that is that God is always leading you to your next most important thing that you need to address, always. The biggest thing you need to address is already... Uh, being exposed to the la in the largest possible way in your life. The problem is that we lack humility to see it. Right? 
So obviously now we can see with the releasing of our pain, humility is one of the main qualities that we need to have. Because humility, remember, is that desire to feel all of your own emotional experiences, both the old ones and the new ones, whether they are painful or pleasurable, and being willing to accept God's definition of, of them. And, that, and that's quite a difficult process, but it is an essential part of you processing your pain. Right? So, so now, um, so, so probably, and this is not in your notes, so I want to I just write something down about this because it's not there yet. It will be there in the final outline. But basically, what I'm saying to you is that God is already... showing me my next thing to deal with. Now this is the case through the entire process. So God's doing this all the time. So right from the denial area God is doing this. <coughs> right. So you remember way back in the beginning, the very first seminar you came to, I don't know if many of you can cast your minds back to that, when we, when we start talking about God, your response to that was, as we discussed the other day, quite negative about that. Was, oh, no, we're not going to talk about religion, are we? And all those kind of things. Now, the fact that you were attracted to an event that then confronted you immediately about your viewpoints of God demonstrates that that's what God was trying to expose to you as your first problem. Does that make sense? And you can see why it's your first problem, because you can't get an education from God about love while you have false beliefs about God herself, can you? So, so you can see why God did that with you, but for the majority of you that was the case. And that brought up a whole heap of feelings about God, the whole word God and religion and other feelings, and, and it took you a while even just to get comfortable emotionally with accepting a discussion about God for many of you. And, and God was leading you to the next thing you needed to address. Now, for many people, they hear the word God and they're out the door. So God leads them to the very next thing they address, to, they needed to address and they weren't humble enough to address it. All right? So there's an old saying. You know what it is? You know the one about horses? You can, you can lead a horse to water or you can't make him drink. <laughs> and... I'm not saying that you were all horses, but, <laughs> <coughs> but God is trying to lead you to the waters of truth, the next truth that you need to accept at every single moment of your life. That's reassuring, isn't it, to know that? And I've found that's always the case. He's always trying to lead. And there are times when I'm not humble enough and I don't see it for months. And there's other times when you're humble enough and you'll see it instantly. It just depends on the level of humility. But God is actually also demonstrating to you that this is the next emotional thing you need to confront. Does that make sense? So once you know that, then identifying and releasing pain is quite easy because God's already showing you the next thing. And all you need to do is be humble enough to see it. And once you're humble enough to see it, you're probably going to be humble enough to, to feel it. And because you don't have the blocking emotion of that global terror, and because you now don't have any judgment about pain anymore, you're not trying to suppress pain, there's a high likelihood you'll just feel it once you've identified it. Now, there are two types of emotions that you will identify in this process. And we've already mentioned them before, but we need to talk about them again. 
And, and so here, in the, this is under the, in your outline, it's under the heading um, Methods to Release Pain. So the two, the two types of... are the multiple event emotions and the single event emotions. And what you'll generally find is that God will expose to you your multiple event emotions first. However, if there is a single event emotion that prevents him from doing so, he will expose that to you next. And the reason why God does that is because God is economical. <laughs> he knows the fastest way that you can get through everything. So what he tries to do is expose to you your biggest problems first. And if he can't do that, he'll then expose to you the small problem that prevents you from seeing the biggest problems first. Does that make sense? So it's really quite simple. God will do that seamlessly. And these are things you'll find out after you do it, probably. Uh, not, not generally before. So, so this is not really about you going... Um, although you can do this, you going, oh, I'm going to write down all the events that have big events in my life that you know, had a big effect on me and I write down all the, the multiple events in my life that have had a big effect on me. You can do that. But at the end of the day, God knows which one of those events is the very next emotion you need to address so that you can address the subsequent ones. So God's peeling back your onion layers for you. That's what God's attempting to do. Does that make sense? Yeah? Before you go to Louise. Um, when you say that he's presenting the next thing for us, do you mean that's his laws or, or do you mean he's actually looking at each one person? That his laws do it, but, but not only that, Louise, it's... Um, when we have a sincere, see, by this, by the time we get to this place here, we've got a pretty sincere desire, haven't we, to address the causes of sin and the pain itself. Now, because of our sincere desire, remember, your sincere desire is a prayer, right? So, so many of you think I say words to God in my mind, and that's the prayer, but but actually, God doesn't hear that unless that is in complete harmony with the feelings and emotions you have about finding something. So, so, so once you engage your true soul-based will, so this down here, use of my will, the opposite of this, here, here to create this, we used our will to refuse to release our pain. Right Now what we're doing is we're using our will to release our pain. So now we're really desirous of releasing our pain. That's like a prayer to God saying, I, I would like as much possible help as I can get to actually find the very next thing I need to find so that I can continue this process of releasing my pain. Now, that prayer God acts upon because this is your will now being expressed to God. So not only is God, God's, laws is opera, God's laws are operating upon everyone, but, but by you engaging this prayer, you are now engaging some other laws now that driven by your desire, which means you will, you will now get additional help to expose the very next things that you need to work on. Does yeah, because like last night um, after the seminar, I numbed out a bit. Yeah. And um, when you said to process or feel into it, I did. And I realised that I was angry and overwhelmed and that I felt I just couldn't face this terror, global terror. Yep. And when I... I had this sort of soul based oh, I imagined that I was at bottom at bottom of Niagara Falls that that's what it felt like that yeah. there was no way I could get to the top and feel my terror yeah and um but I had this soul based will I felt to pray really strongly and then all of a sudden I could have been making up but I was at the top of Niagara Falls and 
I felt all this incredible support come to me yeah. from all different directions, which yeah. felt like a tiny, tiny step towards addressing the terror. Not that yes. it started, but one thing that's going to help you address this terror is knowing that. See, so most of us feel we're completely alone. That's mm -hmm. a reality. Even if you're in a partnership or a marriage or whatever, most of you feel completely alone, really. And uh, because you, you don't believe anybody really understands you at this point, right? But, but once you start this activating this desire, what happens is you, really, you get these interactions with our celestial friends that happen due to your desire being engaged and God responds to that by assigning people to specifically help you with that particular issue. So even the visions you got of bottom of Niagara yeah. Falls... Which felt how no one can get to Which you haven't the thought about much at all, right? No, no. Uh, so these were yeah. all coming from external sources. I mean, I have, I'm very visual, but... Yeah, and they know that. Yeah. So so they, they give you the vision of you at the bottom, that's how it feels, and then you at the top, this is how it feels, this is what it's going to be like. And that helps you develop a little bit of faith that it can improve which means that now you've got less fear about addressing the terror. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so, um, like it's strange, but my faith did increase a little bit. Um, of course. Rather than me intellectually trying to increase my faith, which I've done, and that's yeah. not been so successful, no. that experience last night did increase my faith a little bit. Correct. Yeah. And, that, and that's because it was activated by your desire, and your, your desire is a prayer. And the prayer goes to God and God responds to that beyond what God's laws are already responding. Okay. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And God's going to do that with you with every single thing now that comes up. And God can do that with you way up here with all this stuff. right? But up here is where we're the most resistive. But as we get and we get beyond down to here and beyond this, we now got most of our resistance is gone. And so now you find that God can help you very rapidly to identify many things. And it doesn't mean that you will rapidly process them because that depends a bit on how much fear you have about each individual issue, what your false beliefs and false definitions of love are that you've got to let go. And in this area, you're going to have to take action. You're going to have to take some actions and sometimes those actions are a bit scary and, and you're a bit too frightened of them to do anything about them until you release some of the fear and then then you feel comfortable to do to do those actions or take those actions and then you'll release some emotion and, and you'll release some of the pain associated with it. Does that make sense? So it's a very... What I like about the process actually is that God's designed it to be like very effective but also quite a gentle process if you engage it in a loving way, right? So, so most of you are like frightened of this terribly traumatic process, but the reality is that God is going to do it in the best possible way that it can be done for your welfare, right? But that assumes that your will and desire is engaged. Now, obviously, that's your part that you need to, you need to do. God will not force it upon you. God won't force you to do it. God will only encourage you and respond to your will to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. If we go to Diane here. I might have a question about prayer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I heard you right, but you said that engages another law. Yes, or because prayer is a uh, prayer engages. For, you could say prayer is the law of desire at work, and and this law, which is a which is a soul based law that operates upon the human soul, it it, re, it it basically says, and you can understand why if you consider God to be a God of goodness and God of love, every time you have a desire that is in harmony with love, God will always respond to it, always, without fail. Does that make sense? Yeah. So most of us believe prayers are, prayers are answered haphazardly. Mm -hmm. we, we sort of believe that some prayers are answered, some prayers are not, some prayers are answered, some prayers are not, or very few are answered. But that's not the way it actually is. If your prayer is, is your sole desire and it's in harmony with love, so that's the if, you know, the little word that means a big thing, it has to be in harmony with love. Once your prayer is in harmony with love, every single one of those prayers will be answered. And does that thank you? Does that um, multiply then if a group of people are praying and it's aligned with 
with love. Well, Does can you see a group of people who are going to require the same sincere desire in order for it to be a prayer? Yeah. So it is very, very difficult to encourage a group of people to actually have a prayer together. Because most people, when they get together, they're in their facade yeah. and then they start exercising their facade and those prayer, th there's no prayer then from God's perspective and, and it's not heard. So it's just a mishmash of stuff. Ex exactly. Yeah. Whereas in the spirit world, you know, uh, I'll give you some examples from the Robert James Lee's material. You remember the magnetic chorale. All of the people who were in the auditorium we were singing and, and longing for God to fix the, these persons who were terribly harmed that, that were sitting in front of them uh, or laying in front of them on, on beds. And, uh, and, and they all had the sincere desire that blended together along with Siamese's desire. Mm -hmm. And then these people could, could the Siamese could be used by God mm -hmm. in the, those circumstances. His desire is there now. He could be used by God to blend all of this loving emotion that was coming from all the different people in, and use all of that. And if and if that wasn't enough, also if the the one coming from God. Remember, there was the shaft of stuff mm. coming from God as well, and and it all blended together, mixed together, and healed the person from of those particular problems. So, so this is the same operation here on Earth, exactly the same. We, we can do exactly the same things on earth. But the problem on earth is the majority of us are living in this area here. Mm. And so when we say we're praying... It's not pure enough. It's not... Well, it's not even pure at all usually. No. It's just a... For most people, it's a demonstration of their own holiness. Yeah. Okay. Which is actually not a pure thing at all. So yeah. they're trying to show off, in other words. Yeah. Um, for, most, for most other people, it's got a lot of error in it. Like they're asking God to fix things that they themselves have corrupted. Yeah. Now, you know, God won't fix things that we have corrupted without us being repentant for our yeah, okay. for our actions. So there's a whole lot of laws that must be engaged in the process of prayer. But once you get to this stage of releasing your pain, you can see that you understand a lot of those things by now. And so now my, a lot of your longings and your desires are in harmony. Mm. And certainly the desire to release unloving emotion, which is what the pain is, is in harmony with God's desires for you. And so that prayer will always be responded to, mm. always, mm. without fail. So if God's not responding, what does that tell us? It's not pure. It's not pure. We don't have a pure desire yet yep. to address that problem. Thank you. Yep. Yep. All right. So when we process these uh, emotions, you will find, and I've described in your notes, and I don't know if I want to go through that in a lot more, lot more detail at this stage because we need to probably explain it in detail at some point in the future. But in your notes I've described what it's like to actually get to the stage where you process the multiple event emotions and then what, what it's like to actually go through them, you know, what kind of things you go through. Now bear in mind that many of your emotions, and remember, you go. let's go back a few days to the creation of your pain and the creation of your facade, if you reflect upon those two presentations, one of the things you will notice from those two presentations is that we are in a state where, you know, in the creation of our pain, a lot of our pain was created when we were in a state where we weren't cognizant of it happening. We, we didn't have an intellectual awareness of the damage that was being done, right? And we described some of those damages of, you know, a newborn babe in arms, having a whole heap of projections coming at it from its parents and responding to those kind of projections without there being a conscious awareness of its response to those projections. So that means that those kind of pains, while they are still event-related, they will feel like you don't know what they're about. You see, and this is the thing about releasing pain is that we need to come to understand that much of the pain, the real pain, got created at a time when we weren't cognizant of the, its real cause. In other words, we didn't have some intellectual capability of processing it. We only had the soul-based emotional capability of processing it. So that means that when you feel and release that particular pain, even though it's event-related, you will actually not be aware of why you're crying. So there are, there'll be a lot of times where you might be just cooking in the kitchen or something and all of a sudden this feeling comes over you and you just sit down on the floor and start crying. 
and it might last an hour or half an hour or whatever and then you get up and start <laughs> preparing a meal again. You, those kind of events will be commonplace in this, in this phase where the emotion just flows out of you, you don't really understand why you cried, you don't really understand why you felt sad but you just felt sad and you just cried and, and you release the emotion and that's all you need to do. You don't really have to know what it was about. Can you see that you don't have to know? There's no reason to know. You don't really have to know what it was about. So, Teresa, if we come down here and then Pamela on this side. Does that mean that this whole process is pretty much dealing with the red part of the bucket that you were showing us yesterday, the, the old pain? Um, well, it, you remember by this stage also, you probably aren't creating new pain yeah. because you, you've by this stage you've gotten rid of most of your facade and it's your facade that generates new pain. It's your facade that causes you to sin more. Mm -hmm. So you're now not generating new sin so much. So, of course, what you're releasing is old stuff. Yeah, but little, little stuff like when you're from seven. Well, it can nine. be from any age right up to your age right now. Some of it will be from choices you've made yep. that you become, are cognizantly aware of that you made at the time and then other parts of it will be that would be choices that society or parents made when you didn't even have a developed intellect to know what they were doing but you still felt the pain of it. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So it, it'll be from any time from conception <laughs> through to your current age. Okay. Any pain from those areas. All the way through. Thank you. Yep. The most severe of those will be the ones that relating to what you have chosen to do to sin. And then the less severe ones will be, you know, dependent upon what others have done and so forth and what society has done. Okay. Yep. Thank you. We were over at Pamela. So, not needing to know. I guess that's the same for terror as well. Just no story, just allowing the feeling of terror. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the feeling of terror feels like yet. Mm -hmm. But I had recently an experience of where I was lying on the bed and been doing some deep breathing and I was sweating and I was hot. And it felt like definitely no sound. Sweating and hot is anger. Yes. So there's a layer of anger there, but you don't know what it's about. That's fine. Yeah. Just feel it. And, and I also felt, was it the anger and rage and a mixture of terror involved in that? Or do I not even need to know that? You'll find every time you connect to a real emotion inside of you, your body will work much better just in that moment. And what happens is all the energy systems in your body start to rotate in the right direction. Most of you are aware of your chakras, right? Your seven primary chakra points. The reality is there's a lot more than seven as you progress with divine love, you end up having 12 and then and more after, uh, afterwards, depending on what you develop. But, but initially, there's the seven that we know of, that you that you generally are educated about. Well, most of those chakras are operating at you know in opposite directions or not functioning at all uh, because they're blocked with different emotions. And as you connect to an emotion, what will happen is certain chakras will open all of a sudden and that will allow energy to flow through your spirit and material body. And so you'll have heat generated at different times depending on the flow of energy and what direction it's flowing and, and other times you'll be feel freezing cold and, and so forth. It just depends on what the emotion is as to how you will feel at the time. The key is that you don't have to know, right? You don't have to know. And once you get used to not having to know, the irony is you know more. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like the reason why I know what your emotions are is because I've gone through a process of not having to know releasing all my stuff not having to know and then after that I become aware oh that emotion's this and that emotion's that and that emotion's this and this one's that and that happened this and quite frequently I say to you you know you've had you know, I don't know your lives many times but I say to you like when you're two or three this is what happened to you isn't it you know and, and where did all that come from well that come from now I know but 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 I only know because it's flowing through emotionally now and then triggering a thought does that make sense? It's not something I analyse. And, and we've got to get away from... See, remember our normal way of learning on the planet is to analyse, to think, to regurgitate, to memorise material. 
and, and none of this works at the soul level. Right? So, so it's hard to give up initially because you think you just you think you're getting dumber. <laughs> you know, you think you think that you're getting like less aware, but that's not the case at all. You're becoming far more aware. Oh, I, when I was in my early 30s, I knew I had quite a number of problems, but, but I, I was really unaware of what was going on, what emotions people were projecting at me, what emotions I had, just unaware, you know. And then as you deal with these different emotions, many of which I've been unaware of, later afterwards I become aware. <coughs> so, so that's how you become aware at the soul level, by releasing the emotions that prevent awareness. So fear is, and terror, as you can imagine, is a very large emotion that prevents awareness. Yeah. And so in those terms, don't even need to know whether it's from an inci a, a single event or if it was my mother's imprint into me of her anger and rage or... Oh, I've never yeah. considered those no. things okay. myself, yeah. I know what they are when they're in you because I've gone through my, a lot of mine, but... But the reality is I've never personally considered those things. I haven't had to because I've, once you're humble enough to just feel the emotion no matter what, you, you're not focused on what it is about. You're just focused on letting yourself feel it to the maximum that you can feel it. And, and, and if it's not finished, you know it's not finished because your attractions haven't changed markedly. If, it, if your attractions change markedly, then you know, wow, that's, I've, I've made a major change there. Something major has happened to me now. And you feel differently immediately. Yeah. So what I like about the soul is that everything is immediate. Does that make sense? Everything is immediate. So when you make a real change, the change is immediate. When you pray and it's a real prayer, the response is immediate. Everything's immediate. Like there's no gradual thing. If, if it's sincere and if it's in harmony with love, the change will be immediate. Slow change occurs because we don't allow the full immediate expression. And so what we have to do is build up to it generally. Like, so you might start feeling this uh, emotion of terror and you get, get in it for two seconds and you're out. And before you know it, you're out. Right? And then it might be five seconds, ten seconds. And, and, and like I said, I've had periods where it's been six or seven hours um, where I haven't got out. Right? And the longer you stay in is an indication of, obviously, the amount of humility that you developed. And humility is a quality that you develop. It's not something that you instantly have all the humility required. It's a quality that you need to desire to develop and, and use your will to develop. And, and obviously it would seem then that also there's some degree of self-trust here, trusting this body. No? I don't agree at all. No? Okay. No. It's trust in the way God has made you. Okay. So I don't call that self-trust. No. I call that trust in the way God made me and where God's leading me. Right? So that's all I've had. I don't have very much trust in myself, actually. And in fact, if you knew more about me privately, you'd realise I hardly have any trust in myself, and that's part of my problem. <laughs> that's what I'm working through now. Does that make sense? Mm, but to, in you. order to progress, you don't need to trust yourself. You need to trust God and how God created you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Good eye. So is there any more questions about these kind of emotions? Now, there's a lot of notes there and we haven't said much about them. But obviously one quality is beginning to stand out when it comes to this phase, isn't it? And what's that quality? Humility, isn't it? So it's the quality of humility that is going to be needed in this, in this phase more than anything else. Of course, humility has to have been developed to deconstruct the facade, hasn't it? So every bit of humility that you gain in accepting and then deconstructing your facade is now, and this is a beautiful thing about God too, whatever you develop there now helps you with the next phase. Does that make sense? So isn't that wonderful? You, you, you're developing qualities here that you're not going to give up. In fact, those qualities are going to be essential for the very next phases that you're going to engage. Yeah. So Chris, then.
Um, last assistance groups, you described uh, the cups of water, <coughs> like our emotions as a cup of water or a truck. Mm -hmm. um, is terror and release of terror the same thing? Yeah, well, very. All of you have had different amounts of it. Firstly, and how fast you go through it will depend on how fast you release it. So if you release it out as a little drip once every second, every one, one second every uh, month, then it's going to take you a while, you know what I mean? Yeah. But if you allow yourself to stay in the emotion for an hour a month or a few hours a month, then you can see you can, you're obviously going to go much more quickly through that phase. Yeah. And, and you'll also notice positive benefits much more quickly as you work through that phase. And if you are able to stay in that terror for hours at a time, then obviously, and able to do it sort of each day or every few days, then obviously what might have taken, you know, with one drip every one second every month, might have taken you 150, 200 years to release your terror. Um, now so that might be all squeezed into one month or a few weeks. It just depends on, how, again, our desire and willingness, how rapidly we release. So every drip we release, it doesn't refill, it's gone. No, well, it doesn't refill as long as you don't sin. So there's the proviso. Okay. <laughs> oh. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we can add more terror by sinning more. Of course you can, because every time you sin, you create a false belief. The false belief adds to your fears, and that adds to your global terror. Mm. So... So you remember that every time you sin, you are living by and reinforcing false beliefs. A false belief is a fear. Remember, a false belief is false appearing real. It's a fear that's generated. Each fear that's generated adds to the global amount of fear that you have inside of you. So obviously it's going to contribute to your fears. Every time you act in harmony, with the, every time you act out of harmony with love and, and you sin, it will contribute to your fears. It will add to your fears. It validates your fears. It strengthens your fears. And so that then makes it more difficult to actually release your fears. So, so yes, you, you can see here that the beautiful thing about having an awakening to sin is highly likely is after that that you probably have a, have a desire to not sin anymore. Yeah and you won't engage sin as much, and therefore you won't have new experiences which contribute to your fears and therefore add to the amount of terror that you need to experience. Mm -hmm. All right. Does that make sense to everyone too? Yeah. So, so you've got to realise that every time you sin, not only you know, sin cre it creates the pain, but every time you sin, usually you do all your sinning in this area here where you're acting out of harmony with love all the time. So this regurgitates more sin, if you like. Uh, it's like a feedback system into adding more to your pain. But, but every time you sin, you're also contributing to the layer that's above this as well. You're also detuning yourself, desensitizing yourself. Remember in the first group we talked about using your will to desensitize to sin and, and the process that happens where you just make one little choice or decision and then, and then that co choice that you just made causes you to think, well, I got away with that, um, that should be all right, I'll, I'll do that again. And then you do a worse thing or you do a worse thing and that's, remember we called that the cycle of degradation? Right? And, and this is the problem is that the more we degrade in our condition, the bigger our fear becomes and therefore the larger our resistance to addressing the problems become. So, so you can see that uh, sinning is actually ha has not only the effect of creating more pain but also has the effect of creating more resistance to actually pro progressing and getting down into your pain. Mm. Yeah. So that's why uh, people in the hells of the spirit world are still sinning, they're still trying to do bad things to other people, so they're still sinning, and their pain is intensifying as they go, but each time their pain intensifies, their fear intensifies as well. So they become more and more afraid. Eventually they become so afraid that they stop sinning. But isn't fear driving them to sin in the first place? 
Um, no, it's not necessarily fear that drives you to sin, is it? Sin is a choice, a will-based yeah. choice. So their will-based choice to act in anger or rage, their will-based choice to get their comfort and satisfaction is driving them to sin. And you can remember we said you could be perfect and still sin. You could, you could be. It's harder to, but you could choose to be perfect. You, you know, and the first human couple were perfect. They chose to sin. So you can do that. It's not driven by you know, the pain that's in you that causes you to sin. It's a will-based decision. So you need to separate the concept that sin is an automatic response to the pain that you have. It's not. You can have pain without sinning. You can. And that's a will-based choice that you need to exercise. You follow? Yeah. And, and, and what I see a lot of people doing, they, and, and this is the whole concept of the, on earth is, you know, fl the flawed humanity concept, you know, the whole concept that we were made sinners, the Christian concept that we were made sinners and we need somebody to redeem us from being made sinners. Well, that basically suggests that God made you as a sinner. Well, if God made you as a sinner, God's not perfect anymore and therefore God's not perfect in love anymore. <laughs> Because if he was perfect in love, he certainly wouldn't made you a sinner. He only made the potential for you to sin by giving you the gift of will. But that was your gift, and therefore any sin you engage is your sin. It's like me giving you a knife to cut some bread, and you deciding you're going to stab yourself with the thing or stab someone else with it. Now, that wasn't my intention of how you use the knife, but it is your choice mm. how you use your knife. And, and it's exactly the same with this gift of will. So we need to understand that sin is not an automatic result of pain. It, sin requires the use of our will. Does that make sense yeah. to you, Chris? Yeah. yeah. It requires the use of our will. And, and therefore not sinning requires the use of our will in the opposite direction. Mm. It requires the use of our will to love. And that's why the very first presentation we did the last, the previous week we did was all about developing my will to love. Basically what, it, what it's saying or suggesting to you is if you develop your will to love, you will no longer desire to sin. Right? This, the addictions, cause your desire to sin. And if you develop your will to love, you'll no longer want to desire sin. And that can happen whether you have pain or not. So you've got to be very careful thinking that all of your sin is a result of pain that you have, because mm. it's definitely not. Yeah. I know many people have had extreme amounts of personal pain, and yet they've resisted sinning in the way that others who have had the same amount of pain have sinned. Right. So... There's, it is a, a very much to do with your choice, very much to do with that will, the exercise of your will. All right. All right, now, j just briefly I'd like to mention that obviously we need the tools again, don't we? So here we're seeing particularly the fourth tool, the emotion tool, is going to now come into play. But obviously we still need the other tools. We need to take action still. It's no good... It's no good, uh, you know, as God exposes an emotion to us and, and uh, instead of just letting ourselves succumb to the tears of that emotion or whatever the emotion is, we uh, avoid succumbing to the tears. Well, that's an action we're taking that's not positive for us. And we still need to want long for the truth, don't we? Because it's all about finding and remembering things as well. So we need to long to know what... The truth is about what emotions are in us. So this is an essential part. And we still need to have faith. So these tools are, again, very, very important for, for us to develop if we wish to release pain. The other thing, as we've already pointed out, is the, is the ability to pray to God for God's love in this phase. Because you're now releasing pain more and more of your real self starts popping out. And as a result of that, you, you start connecting to how you feel about God in a different way and you start longing to God in different ways that you haven't done before. And as a result now, God's love can flow into you as long as you've engaged the laws associated with forgiveness and repentance. 
And so this is something we're going to talk about with you much more when it comes to the removal of sin and the understanding of sin, uh, which will be now probably in a couple of years' time. But, but it's important to understand that you're much more open to those th concepts when you're in this place. In fact, you want to engage those laws when you're in this place rather than resist them. All right. So that's not everything we could say about it. Obviously, in your notes, you can see there's a lot more being said in your notes. And, and uh, maybe in the Q&A we have next, you have an opportunity to ask about some of those notes uh, if you had any things ra raised from those particular notes. But what I wanted to do is just cover with you the basic principles of invo involved in feeling this underlying pain, you know, what you would classify as causal emotional pain. And, uh, and, and what process you'll need to go through. Now, obviously, as you release pain, there's, there's a cycle that will go on between your false beliefs and false definitions of love and your pain. So what will happen is that you'll release a pain and then you'll realise, ah, oh, now I don't believe that about love anymore that I used to believe. Right? So you also let go of your evil definitions. Or the opposite to love definitions. And that's an automatic process of release. Now, sometimes they're a bit stubborn, and what you've got to do instead of that is to look at your false beliefs and go, I still believe something here that I know is out of harmony with God's love. So I've been told it by somebody else or something that it's out of harmony with God's love, but I still feel it like I'm right. And, that, and sometimes that can help you dig into the pain that you feel about that particular thing. Does that make sense? So you can actually identify your false beliefs and identify your false definitions of love, and particularly with the assistance of other people who have already been through the process, you can identify them, and then that can help you sometimes identify some pain that you haven't felt yet. And, that it mu and at least you know that it must be there, and then you can start praying about, well, if it's there, why isn't it coming out? There's obviously some of my resistance here, there's some fear here that I need to feel. And so what you finish up doing is going through sort of these cycles of r r identifying that there must be some fear, feeling the particular fear, and then all of a sudden the little bit of the emotion, the pain that's underneath it comes up and is released, and then you go on to another one and so forth in a, in a in in continuing cycle until it's all released. Now, some of them are quite extreme v viewpoints of love. And when, and when you come to feeling about your own worth, for example, you will find there's quite extreme unloving viewpoints inside of yourself. And attached to those extreme unloving viewpoints is quite a bit of unlo you know, quite a lot of painful emotion as well. And you'll find that you're going to be quite resistive to dealing with that for a while and so the key there is to pray about breaking down the resistance and finding what these false beliefs are and seeing how the laws are working to expose these beliefs to you praying to God for help to see their beliefs and then as you become more aware then eventually you get to the point where you are humble enough to let the emotion out and then once the emotion's out then it's done does that make sense so it's this cycle based process and You'll need to do that for as long as it takes. And if it takes 20 years, it takes 20 years. If it takes five years, it takes five years. Does and, and in this place, you don't really care how long it takes, actually. All you care about is continuing to do, do it, continuing to change. Right Now, by this stage in your life as well, because you're reducing your pain, you're repenting for the causes of sin, obviously the amount of love you display to other people is now starting to increase. And also the law of attraction will be demonstrating to you that your life is becoming more loving in the way that you're making choices and decisions. Things, things in this phase, usually you start embracing your true nature and your true desires and passions. And, and in that process, some wonderful opportunities get offered to you. And it's a matter of purifying your desire and purifying your intent, bringing all of your desires and intentions in harmony with love. And as you do that, those particular things will grow in your life. Right? So it's a place of constant change by the time you get to this place. 
This part's really stubborn and it's really hard to work through and it doesn't feel like you know sometimes making much progress for a while. But when you get down to dealing with these things, everything starts sort of working a lot more rapidly, change occurs a lot more rapidly, and things in your life change more rapidly, relationship change more rapidly, whether you're in one or out one, you, you track cer certain events and so forth that cause that change. And, and as you're releasing more and more of the pain associated and the causes of sin that are, that are inside of you, you find that your life is becoming a much more enjoyable experience than it was before and you really feel it. It's not a fake, you know, it's not, a, it's not you know, trying to manufacture that you're happy or anything like that. Also, you find that your desire for things like alcohol disappears, your desire for drugs disappears, your de desire for sweet foods disappears. You, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the desires that you have that currently are used to mask your facade or to mask your terror and these painful emotions, a lot of them disappear naturally. During that phase, if you're overweight, you'll lose weight. If you're underweight, you'll gain a bit of weight. Right? Everything will balance up. So I went through a period where my, my weight went right down uh, um, to, I think it was uh, well, 61 kilograms or something, which is pretty, pretty light, isn't it, uh, for a person my height. And, and I, I looked quite bad, and everyone was telling me I looked pretty bad, of course. Everybody wants to do that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I just kept going and kept going. And once I worked through the different emotions that stopped my, stopped my body from just shedding weight, then I started putting weight back on again. And now I'm back up to 78 kilograms again. Does that make sense? So you have changes in your body occurring. And the key is to not get stressed out about the whole thing. And, and people will want to tell you you're doing, you know, you're making a mess of things and so forth. But once you get to this phase, generally you've got so much faith in the process, a lot of faith in God. You know that God's going to show you what you need at any one point in time and, and you just engage the process. Yeah. Sound all right to you? Hmm. Hard to get there, yeah, hard to get there, but a few, some few big things to get through first. But once you're through them, it's, uh, you're on in the road. So, Alan, thanks. Um, I guess I feel that I have false beliefs already up the top where the denial techniques are. Like I'm, you're hitting them as you're looking at them, and 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 it feels like. Yeah, but these are more false beliefs about the facade. False beliefs about you know, the reasons for your facade. Down here, the false beliefs are usually about love and truth, what is true and what is not. So this is a lot about how the pain has influenced your belief systems and then triggered the desire for the facade. Uh, yeah. So so there are different types. You you will find that there's false beliefs up here. Certainly there's a lot of them up here, yeah. heaps of them. Yeah. But but and they're all based on satisfying addictions and the justifications to satisfy them. Yep. Whereas down here, they're all based upon suppressing pain. Right. So, so they're a completely different flavour to them, if you like. Yeah. Yep. So yep. It's, the false beliefs are all the way through down to sin. Of but course. But like you say... You wouldn't even be sinning unless you had some false beliefs generally. Right. Or that you had some false use of your will. You know, like some... Th things that you're hoping to get from using your will that you're not going to get because you don't understand God's laws. Yep. Yep. Good. Yep. It's good. All right. Well, let's have a 10 minute break, shall we? If we come back at uh, 20 past 12, shall we? And, uh, and we'll continue with the Q&A on this subject.